it's a real pleasure to have David Popple here. Um, we actually managed to get him just one day before he's moving away from Maryland. He's now at the University of Maryland and going to New York, I guess tomorrow, I hear, um, to start a new career. My furniture is going tomorrow. <laughs> well, your furniture is going tomorrow. Um, David has done a tremendous work in a whole range of areas, um, and I guess today he's going to be telling us about temporal primitives in auditory cognition and speech perception. Yes. Is, do I need to turn myself on or I'm, all, I'm good to go? Thank you very much for having me and for tolerating me. It's interesting to be in a classroom in which, among other topics, you're going to hear about some of my research, but also apparently thermosensitive soul gel reversible hydrogels, which is not, but closer to my own interests, the picture of Dorian Gray, the 19th... <laughs> 19th century British novel with one of the lecture topics was uh, Art and Morality 1, <laughs> followed by Art and Morality 2. I, I hope I can live up to that kind of, you know, yeah. high neuroesthetic bar. So, um, although this is about, so let me tell you, let's start with some poetry. Uh, so, a piece of poetry from Newton who we all, of course, admire, not because of his religious convictions, but because of his uh, mathematical intuition. And he said the following about time. Absolute, true, mathematical time, of itself and by its own nature, flows equably without relation to anything external. Which is very beautiful and very poetic and basically means this. Right? So there's an arrow of time and we treat it as a continuous var variable. Uh, only he said it you know, more beautifully. Um, now, what is your intuition about how time works? Well, it's exactly like that. Your intuition is more or less that time flies like an arrow. Right? This is sort of like, you know, Groucho Marx said, time flies like an arrow. And yeah, everybody says it. Uh, now, what I want to tell you about in the next two and a half hours is that our brain is much more likely, a, mo a more pleasing interpretation is that it's really something like this, like a series of temporal islands or temporal windows. So it's not like an arrow, but it's more like beads on a string. And more, yet more particularly, I want to persuade you that our brain really is doing something like this. So that it's basically some kind of multi-time resolution sampling of a continuously varying input. If you understand this premise, then you can, we can stop and proceed to the cookies. Because that's basically the whole story. Right? So I'm going to try to argue that this kind of view is, uh, as I call it, the correct view. Uh, now, um, a little bit more, so building towards the story a bit, um, a way to develop an intuition for what I have in mind is to say, well, what you have, so this is a, a, an axial slice through a brain and sort of you know, auditory areas. What I have in mind is that you really take some auditory signal, so this is a continuously varying waveform, the stuff we know and love, and you see that signal through windows of different sizes, or through different slits or different integration windows. Some are shorter, like the ones on top here, and we'll talk more about how short or long, and some are much longer. So the very same signal gets viewed through different size openings. And so even on the simplest hypothesis that the analysis happening on the data is identical, which one could uh, suppose, you'd get a very different kind of output. That is, the nature of what you have to work with is going to be very different simply as a function of the size of the window. So think of just taking a spectrogram. If you just calculated a spectrogram, it would look very different uh, as a function of how many points enter in this, right? So far, so uh, one additional point is going to be not only that there are multiply sized time windows, but that they're differently distributed in the brain. We're not going to talk about that so much. That's of less, less interest to this particular audience, I would think. So how, what do I have in mind? How does this work? What I think is um, going on, well, here, here's the, let me lay out the hypothesis, and then I'll, I'll walk you through it a bit. Uh, what I think is going on is the following. These two hypothetical distributions are basically the proportion of neuronal ensembles, or basically like, you know, a hill of chips, with a particular preferred integration constant. And so my premise is that there's a whole family of uh, neuronal ensembles that have as a preferred time constant roughly, you know, 25, 30 milliseconds, ballpark, 
uh, distributed around that, and some other family of cells with a much longer temporal integration constant of, let's say, uh, 250, 300 milliseconds, something like that. Right? So there's a family of cells like this and a family of cells like that. So far, so good. So those basically reflect temporal integration of some type. Now, uh, if we look at both hemispheres, this is now, let's say this is the, my, my count in the left hemisphere, and this is my count in the right hemisphere. Notice that there's a bit of a, uh, of a difference in the distribution. This distribution is li slightly larger in the right. We'll get to that later. So here's the idea. Uh, an auditory signal comes in. Some, you know, this is the vibrations of the ear. I go blah, and it vibrates your ear. And that uh, initial analysis through the afferent auditory pathway goes more or less symmetrically. So you then create some kind of spectrotemporal receptive fields in core auditory cortex. Right? So you have, let's say, a pretty good CD quality recording in your head. And you look down, on the and then you actually break that CD into slightly different kinds of things. So you basically resample, and you basically create an asymmetric elaboration of the initial representation. So you have a pretty good initial representation in the auditory cortex, and then you break it into something that you sample with a higher rate, and something that you sample at a lower rate. Right. So if this is on the right track, it has some interesting consequences. For instance, just from a lateralization point of view in the brain, uh, you would have the popula these cells would be much more strongly driven by things that require high, uh, a lot of transients or high temporal resolution. These populations will be much more driven by things that require a high spectral resolution. So that's, but the, the, the critical point is this. There's t at least two. You know, there's a bunch of other time constants, but there's at least two that play some kind of privileged role. I feel like I have to go over there for these gentlemen because it would be rude to speak only to you. So now I'll speak all the way over here. Uh, okay, now this view is obviously embedded in some kind of functional anatomy. I mean, this is not sort of uh, in a vacuum. The functional anatomy is something I've developed over the last few years with my colleague Greg Hickok at UC Irvine. Here's a recent instantiation of this. Uh, the assumption was, so, uh, is that all of the stuff I talked about just now and that we're going to talk about today happens in the basically in the superior temporal gyrus, the various aspects of the superior temporal gyrus, so the auditory, different parts of the auditory cortex, and that there's, a, that there's a, you know, two processing streams that deal with different kinds of information and uh, create different kinds of representations. There's a, a ventral stream, we call it, so this is, you know, goes ventrally in the brain, deals more with mapping towards, let's say, roughly meaning. So it's a sound to meaning mapping. And then there's a dorsal stream that's this dorsal stream here that deals basically with a mapping from auditory representation to motor representation. Uh, you can obviously read, this has been published a bunch of times and you can read about it and I don't want to belabor the point too much. So the stuff I'm talking about now, the multi-time resolution processing, which is the thing I, you know, I care about, is we're talking about these aspects of the brain. So superior temporal gyrus. So you roughly know where we are. Now obviously, I also have beliefs about what is a profitable theory to think about speech recognition. The one I'm currently excited about is uh, a, a really old one that was wrong before and it's going to be wrong again, but I still like it, which is analysis by synthesis. And it's building on ideas that Morris Halley and Ken Stevens first published in the late 50s and that was elaborated in a very interesting way by Ulrich Neisser in an influential textbook called Cognitive Psychology in 1967 and was then subsequently ignored for the next 40 years. Uh, and it's been making an interesting comeback actually pri primarily in visual object recognition. So in the context of people talking about Bayesian perception and, and their predictive coding, there's a lot of interest in the idea of analysis by synthesis. So my own view is that that's an interesting, uh, that there's an internal forward model that you use for recognition. And where the t stuff I'm going to talk about fits in, in that view, is roughly that you have some input signal that you analyze in the afferent auditory pathway, and that one of the crucial things you do when we're now you know, uh, talking about speech is that you narrow it down. You analyze information on both a segmental and a syllabic scale. And that's what I want to go in more deeply. Okay, so there's parallel analyses at multiple time scales. I'm going to say that message every couple of minutes so that you'll really remember it. Okay. So now I want to talk about one. So if I had. Uh, 
the allotted two and a half hours, I would do the following, uh, or I tried to do the following. What, what do I owe you? I would owe you evidence that there really is temporal integration on the shorter time scale. You'll have to take my word for it that there is actually a huge amount of evidence for that. Further, I would owe you evidence that there's integration on this longer time scale, roughly 200 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds, and you again have to take my word for it that it exists. Uh, then I would owe you evidence that there's actually some perceptually relevant interaction between information on these different scales. And if there's a little time at the end, I, I might show you an experiment that shows that's kind of you know, fun and compelling. Uh, the fourth piece of evidence I would have to show you is that there's some kind of lateralization of function. That's what I claimed as well. And that too, that I can actually show you quite, quite straightforwardly. But I think the most interesting is to, to actually walk you through a couple of very recent experiments that highlight that this multi-time thing actually is, uh, what, what aspect, uh, you know, what kind of evidence is suggestive and what does it tell us about speech recognition? So, and uh, about the sort of gra temporal granulation of the perceptual process. Um, and the experiment uh, I want is really largely due to Juan Luo, who's a former graduate student now at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, we did the following, uh, we took the following approach. We read the animal literature and then stole ideas we really liked. Uh, in particular, <laughs> we, um, what we had in mind is, we, we read these uh, couple of papers, for instance, by Christian Machens and Andreas Herzen and by Narayan and others. This is uh, actually a paper from BU uh, that did the following very simple thing and kind of, you know, almost, you know, mind-blowing in its simplicity and its experimental not, uh, naivete. You take, you, you play some, uh, you, you play a signal to some animal. So in this case, uh, the uh, grasshopper, grasshopper vocal, and in that case they're not vocalizations because it's, they move their, so it's footalizations, right? So they move their feet to make sound. And you, so they, they footalize and you record cells, you record neurons, and then you try to figure out, is there anything in the firing rate that would allow me to discriminate what vocalization or footalization they actually heard. Right? So very simple experiment. So you record some grasshopper sound, uh, then you record the spike train and you say, hmm, what can I do to actually, what kind of analysis would show me what in the spike train discriminates between the different vocalizations? Right? So you're gonna t I'll show you in a second what the analysis is because we stole it. A very similar analysis was done by Narayan and Kamal Sen's lab. They play songs to songbirds. Uh, so this is zebra finch. They uh, record spike trains. And again, they say, well, what kind of analysis do I have to do on the spike train to basically use it as a classifier for different kinds of vocalizations? And so we, you know, this the experiment I'm about to tell you is deeply inspired by this kind of analysis from the animal literature, from the single unit literature. Uh, now, why the, the, the experiment I'm about to tell you uses the technique magnetoencephalography, MEG. Why, why do I care? A lot of what we, what we know is that single unit responses are pretty good at encoding vocalizations, right? So that's one piece of data. The other thing is we know is that if we just use imaging on humans, for instance, this is data from my own lab, this is data from Sophie Scott's lab, that well, we can kind of pinpoint more or less with pretty, you know, somewhat coarse, but it's not insanely coarse, where to look for intelligibility, for instance. And so that's, all, you know, that's pretty robust and replicable data. But the question is, how can we possibly relate that? I mean, what's the end game here? I mean, I can read single unit papers all day long, and then I can read imaging papers all day long, but never the twain, I mean, like, these are unrelated, right? These are, it makes no sense. So the the levels of description are so different that my take on this is, look, if we're ultimately interested in human perceptual analysis, uh, let's use timing as a potential linking hypothesis. Timing information is something I get out of spike trains in a very, you know, very, very specific way, and timing information is something I can get successfully out of electrophysiological data from humans in a non-invasive way. So what timing? Which aspect of timing? Well, spike train is one thing, human speech is another thing, so what, what parts of timing am I interested in? Well, at the most uh, broad level, if we take some, uh, you know, some utterance of a person, we can find more or less 
three types of things, three different types of temporal phenomena that we're going to care about. So if you look at the envelope, more or less, of the, of the waveform, that maps pretty roughly, but you know, so a first approximation to syllabic information. If we look at, the, at a much finer scale, if we look at the fine structure, it maps, again, you know, coarsely, but you know, good enough to phonemic information. And if we look at periodicity in the signal, it does a pretty good job of telling us something about the speaker. So there are different scales in the time domain that seem to give, have different perceptual interpretation. And uh, now we know, of course, that different information in the time scale conveys different linguistic information. So this is not some kind of innocent random choice. It's a, it's a principal choice because it conveys different kinds of stuff about what you're trying to accomplish. For instance, um, suppose you're this kind of person. You know, you're, uh, suppose you're a classical person. You say, uh, my, my interest is I want to recognize, we had this discussion earlier, dog. Like your dog understands uh, you. I want you to understand the word dog. Okay, well, how do you do that? The classical view, as it were, is you break this into little pieces. You get D-type sounds, uh-type sounds, G-type sounds. You sum over them, and you end up with dog. Right? A very different kind of view would be that you actually break it into larger chunks first. So something that somebody like Steve Greenberg would argue, Dupu, many others, that you first go dog, you, get, you bite off a bigger chunk, and then you look inside. And you say, well, is, is there a more fine-grained analysis? Uh, both have to be true at some level. Because both levels of representation carry information that you demonstrably use and that are different and that are actually not that easy to get out of other signals. So how can we have our cake and eat it too? Well, obviously my way is you have multi-time resolution. You have both things. And so uh, if you have both things, you certainly have the longer thing. So now let's narrow the whole story down to the longer thing and, go, and, and focus on this particular experimental design. So what we're thinking about here is that um, if you do psychophysics, and in particular you look at the psychophysics and you change the temporal modulation of speech, it turns out that uh, there are particular bands, frequency bands, that have a really important contribution to intelligibility. That is, if you mess them up, you suck. Right? Uh, so Drollman has a series of papers, Greenberg, Hermansky, Maria Haidt from my lab. And so basically, in the range of 4 to 6 to 8 hertz, that seems to be a rate of modulation that has an absolutely critical, critical contribution to intelligibility. What is that rate? I mean, is it just sort of some random rate? Well, it has a particularly tight relationship to the syllabic structure of an utterance. So this modulation rate is actually commensurate with more or less the syllabic flow. And if we say that a phrase, some sentence, is defined acoustically defined by the rate of the syllabic change, then it may be the case if you analyze information on a long time scale that something like a syllable ends up being a computational primitive. Right? So this is like the, I was showing you on the other slide. Do you bite off bigger chunks or do you bite off smaller chunks in your discretization of the perceptual problem? So the experiment we do asks then, well, is there a cortical response that's sensitive to this critical modulation rate? Right? So now. We're not, we're, I'm neither a cricket or a grasshopper nor a bird. I'm listening to human speech, not cricket fertilizations. And I'm not recording single units, but I'm recording non-invasively from the whole head. And I'm asking, is there something in the brain response that's sensitive to the modulation rate we know to be essential for speech intelligibility? Right? So far, so good? I mean, it's, it's kind of straightforward, right? So we do this. Yes? Right. I, I'm still trying to understand what you mean when you say that 4 to 6 hertz is critical for intelligibility. Do you mean that if I talk really fast that you don't understand me? Uh, you can talk really fast, but if you talk faster than, say, if, if I compress you down to a rate where you exceed, let's say, 8 hertz, 10 hertz, you, in fact, I, I will not understand you. So there's, there are actually principled limits on this. So fast talkers and slow talkers, although they seem subjectively over a, a while, the variation is actually not as dramatic as you would think. Right. Down to a compression ratio of like 0.3, actually have doing, uh, you, you're still OK. At 0.25, by the way, you're a disaster. I'm doing a cool experiment. I can't tell you this right now. There's no time. I'm doing this kind of cool experiment. Nah. <laughs> Ask me later. <laughs> OK. What are we doing? We're sticking, we're, we're, uh, so we're, we're sticking people into this particular electrode. This, is a really, this looks like a toilet. 
and is in fact an, a magnetoencephalography scanner. Right? So what does it give you that, uh, what does it allow you to do? Uh, the toilet? Yes. To, uh, well, it doesn't have a flushing thing, so that's a problem. So inside of this device, there are 160 sensors. Uh, there, there's a bunch of different ones of this flavor. They range from about 140 to 300 sensors. This entire thing is bathed in liquid helium to keep it at superconducting temperatures. And the sensors are in here pointing at your head, and they pick up the magnetic flux generated by intracortical current flow. Right? So it looks something like this. Right? So, neuro, so the gray dots are just the digitization of someone's head shape. Right? So I just have some kind of stylus, and I paint your head. Right? It would be good in your case. Get a nice head. And then I stick you in the machine. I play you some sound. Beep, 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 beep. It, so here's the cool thing. right? Intracranial current flow. Is, generates a magnetic field that's big enough to be visible outside of the head. This is now about five centimeters away. I mean, that's cool, right? That's just science fiction-y. But you know, whatever. Uh, incidentally, it's, it's, uh, I just learned an important lesson. As, you know how you, you meet people and you say, well, I had really good chemistry with this person. This suggests that you should stick your head together and you should say if you have good physics with each other. <laughs> because it clearly shows that you have, you know, there's something con con compelling contribution. Okay, so we record this magnetic field at the outside of uh, extracranially. It's very sensitive, right? So we're talking the size, the order of magnitude here, these are 10 to the minus 15 Tesla. Right? So femto Tesla. All of this happens in a shielded room. And then the data looks something like this, right? So here's time. So this is, uh, you know, a, this is a second worth of data. This is 160 channels now all put on one line, basically. So you can visualize it. Here's some stimulus starts. Maybe it's a tone. Beep, right? And you get a series of bumps and valleys. And you can, one of the nice things about MEG data is you can figure out reasonably well the source of, this, of these bumps, right? So you can, for instance, calculate what's the magnetic field distribution at this point in time. So maybe it'll look like this. And then I can use these data to calculate, you know, it's still an inverse problem. You're, you're not going to get it right, but you're going to get a good solution. What's the neuronal origin of this field? Right? And then you can do that for all points in time. For the experiment I'm about to show you, and we're interested actually in the ongoing activity during the presentation of a sentence. I'm not interested in the onset right now. So you know, I say the computer is on the table. Obviously, there's all kinds of interesting onset responses. I'm interested in the ongoing activity during the sentence, just like the grasshopper vocalization, just like the spike train, right? So this is, conceptually, this is going to be the equivalent to the spike train. So it's, you know, activity going throughout the sentence. Okay, so here comes the, here's, here's the one part to, to pay attention. You, now you have to wake up. For, for just yes, go. yes, okay, good. The previous one. So go back to the uh, MEG picture. Yeah, one, one more before this. So uh, what are we measuring there? Are these the current intensities uh, at, at that point in, in space? Right. So this is yeah. It's this is not the ideal picture to show you MEG. Let me. Uh, well, I can explain it. So y y this is all okay, right. So. There's 160 places in here, okay. covering the entire head. Each one is a gradient. Uh, well, each one is some detector for magnetic flux. It's basically a coil. Okay. Right? So that coil picks up the magnetic flux the magne generated by intracranial current flow. Right. So I play a sound. Beep, 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 beep. And the, it generates in the auditory cortex some current. That current is really small. Right. So we're talking about, you know, in the best case. The biggest ones are like picoampere, right, really small, but still, but, and, and it has the famous right-hand corkscrew configuration. So here's current flow in your auditory cortex or in your visual cortex. It generates this magnetic field. Right? So depending on the configuration, you can measure this, uh, the, the magnetic field generated by the current flow on the outside. So these dots here are the detectors. Okay. I mean, this is just an example. I picked, you know, I picked 10 or something like that. But there's 106 of these. Each detector measures that particular property, that is the magnetic flux at the surface. And then you can basically, through spline interpolation, you can calculate this kind of nice map. And then what you get, of course, is because of this relationship, 
you get the magnetic field coming out of the head or going back into the head, for instance. And you can use that data to then calculate the underlying source. Okay, and this. to what uh, physical, like, you know, how local is your estimate? Are you within a five millimeter? Uh, that's good. I mean, that, that's real good. So I'd say in the best case, five to 10 millimeter spatial resolution, like two point resolution, something like that. But, uh, but that being said, with a, uh, with a millisecond temporal resolution, Oh. Right. So your spatial resolution is, uh, you know, compared to single units, is terrible. But it's millisecond temporal resolution and in the order of a centimeter spatial resolution is pretty good enough for government work. More importantly, if, if it's like, you know, other, the alternate would be some sort of fMRI or something whose temporal resolution I, I believe is pretty good. Well, the temporal resolution is not as compelling for this kind of thing, yeah. I mean, it's wonderful for other things. Um, okay, so now here, here's what we do. Now here, Here's the thing that I like about this experiment. It steals an interesting data analytic technique from single units, but more importantly, it's a data analysis focused on single trials. There's by and large, when we do brain imaging, whether it's electrophysiological or hemodynamic, we average a lot of responses. So I play you, you know, a bunch of vowels, ah, 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 ooh, e, ooh, ah, whatever, and I average trial types, and I get a pretty good signal to noise, and I get a nice, you know, robust response. What we did here is uh, quite a bit different, is we're analyzing the data from single trials. So here, here's the design of the study. We play uh, participants different kinds of sentences. And they're all four seconds long. So, you know, my computer uh, is right next to the water. Right? Three different sentences. And people do nothing. They just lie there they, and, and they, they listen to them. And they don't have to, re I mean, these are, you know, played at 65 dB, very, you know, very clearly intelligible in a quiet environment. This machine makes no noise, unlike fMRI, which is very loud. Okay, it makes no noise, and we're recording the ongoing activity, and we do this, let's say, in this case, 21 times. Right? So you hear it, and it's completely intermixed. You hear this sentence, and maybe you hear this one, then you hear this one, then you hear some control sound, and so on and so forth. Now, the ra here, here's the, the idea we have. We say, and this is actually literally adapted from the single units uh, experiment. We say, look, if there is an acoustic signature to a sentence that's unique to that sentence because it's a unique sentence, and I keep playing it, I wonder if that signature of that sentence is visible in the brain response in each trial. If that's true, then suppose we look across trials. So we did 21 trials, and then we line up the 21 trials here and here. Then across trials, there should be something in the brain's response that's more coherent or more systematic for one sentence you know, across the group of sentences than some control group of mixed sentences. So some property of the brain response should be systematic across this group and this group and this group compared to some mixture of the sentences. I mean, it's very straightforward, right? So there should be, in particular, we're interested in so cross-trial coherence. So we look trial by trial, we calculate coherence, and we're interested, in particular, in the power and the phase of the response. And we calculate, and the, the, the hypothesis is, look, uh, we assume that either the cross-trial phase coherence is bigger in this group compared to this group, right? Or the cross-trial power coherence is bigger in this group than this group. So far, so good? Because that's the only trick. Uh, the, the rest is like falling off a truck. I mean, if you're still with me, then you're home free, as it were. Yeah. OK, so that, that's it. That's the import from this analysis. And what, so what, what actually happens? Well, it's pretty neat, actually. So here's that analysis. We calculate the cross-trial phase coherence and power coherence and, and compare it to some across group mixture. And we do that for all of them. And then we look at, in this case, the uh, we now do a, basically a subtraction to compare them directly. We calculate for here and here. We subtract them. And we look at either the phase, which is now a dissimilarity, right? It's a difference, either in phase or in power. Now, right away, you see one important thing. There's just one bump, right? And, the bu and so the question is, What's the bump? Does the bump matter? So first of all, let me tell you where there's no bump, because it turns out to be important for the interpretation. There's no bump in the power. Right, so this goes from 0 to 50 hertz. So we're calculating the coherence of frequency. There's nothing particularly, this is for one channel over the auditory cortex, and this is now 
over 20 channels, you know, with, uh, so with some estimate of the error. So let's look at here. So there's no interesting uh, response in the power. So there's nothing in the power of these sentences that actually allows you to discriminate them. More interestingly, there's something in the phase. And the bump in the phase is in a very particular spot. Namely, it's roughly 4, 6, 8 hertz. Right? So there's the bump, and that's actually a significant bump. Uh, now, if you, look at, if you look at now the spatial distribution of this phase dissimilarity, right, so if you look all the way on the left, the theta phase dissimilarity has a pretty nice organized spatial distribution. I'll come back to that in a second. Whereas the other frequency bands don't, and you can see there's, there's no action there anywhere. Yeah? What's your error bars on the top right figure? Uh, they're, they're, very they're very small. They're very small. I mean, you, you can. So they're the same. Yeah, they're really, yeah, that's, they're, they're, the error bars are actually pretty, you know, helpfully nice there. Okay. Now, Another that, question. yes? These 21 trials of sentence one, I guess they're from the same subject, the same human? Uh, you mean the, the, the sentence itself? No, 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 the, the person who. Oh, this. Well, no. This is, well, this is actually from an. Uh, this is across subject data. But we've. Yeah. Let me show you. In a, here. Let me. The reason I ask is whether, uh, like, you know, after all, you don't know quite what you're measuring. You're just asking what is coherent across. Right. So we're we're using different individuals. There would be less coherent. Yes, absolutely. But let me show you. I mean, we're we're actually. So this this is actually across subjects. This is across. So now let me show you an example of individual subjects. How, how this actually looks, if this ever shows up. Okay. So here's here's six subjects. And now, to, so the first thing, the, the first message was, okay, where was the interesting response? It was theta phase, right? So theta phase turned out to be the thing that really gave you discrimination. So now, it, that must be a very sensitive index. So now let's see if we can, it has the right sensitivity. So let's see if we can unpack this a bit. So the theta phase, and this is incidentally, remember, single trial. So you just got four seconds worth of data from the brain. Now, what do we do here? We, here's, uh, here's a subject's spa uh, the topographic distribution of the brain response just to a sine wave, just to a tone. This is like a kilohertz tone. Beep, right? Just, just to make sure as a control we know where, what, what the distribution looks like for the auditory response. Here is the, for the six different subjects, the theta phase bump. Obviously very small. And these are tiny, tiny, tiny. We're talking about, you know, this really is 10 to the minus 15 Tesla. It's awfully small. But it's, you know, it's a credible auditory cortex distribution. We're not concerned with it. Now, here's what we did. We said, now let's take that bump, and let's see how good is that bump at discriminating between the three sentences. So we simply do a classification analysis. We do it a 1,000 times over and over, and we say, OK, for this subject here, how good is, you, know, you take one of the responses as your template, and then you sort the other ones against it. How good is sentence one at being mapped to sentence one? Well, sentence one is good at sentence one, sentence two at two, and three at three. Unsurprisingly, otherwise I wouldn't be showing you this. Here is that analysis across subjects. So this is the, for the original sentence, no weird manipulation. So sentence one gets successfully uh, classified as one, and so on and so forth. Right? Th th that's kind of cool. So, so that theta phase really is good at telling you wh which one, you know, which bin you were in. Were you bin one, bin two, bin three? Which is nice because it has a real interpretation. Next trick. In the next trick, we say, let's, we know that that's related to intelligibility. We know that from the work of Henex. I mean, this is, you know, re that, that, re that temporal modulation is really critical to understanding stuff. Let's mess up understanding and see what happens to the theta phase. So we took the materials of Smith, uh, Bertrand de Gutt, and Andy Oxenham from an earlier paper. Because what they had done is they had mucked with sentences in a way that you could sort of calibrate intelligibility. So the, you know, basically they made like lousy sentences. You know, they changed the envelope and the fine structure, and they could give you some kind of behavioral assay of how well or how poorly you did. So for instance, uh, if you have if you split it just into four bands and you do a certain you can your, you can calibrate your intelligibility about 85 percent. If you just give one big thing a fine structure, you could go down to 70 percent. They have a whole range of manipulations in this paper. So we took this these materials, we treated them the same way, and we said, well, how good are you now? Well, now if you take materials where your intelligibility is bad, your theta phase discrimination goes systematically down. So that's good. We, so we explored that a bit further, because that looks like that this response has the right sensitivity, but it also has the right specificity to do this classification. So we took a bunch of, you know, so here's the, here's the original sentences. 
and then different kinds of manipulations, right? So this uh, breaking it down into a bunch of uh, you know, four different bands, just fine structure, and so on and so forth, with different levels of intelligibility. And then we do this classification analysis, and we show that as your intelligibility goes down, your classification goes down, right? So there's a very nice index between how good you are at understanding this stuff and the, ab and the ability of the brain to extract that particular rhythmicity. Now, it's a different question of where that comes from. Right? And that's, that's a deep, complicated issue of it. But it means if that's no longer there, then you're not understanding anything. Now, um, it develops. I don't want to belabor that too much um, because I want to get to the next two experiments because I think they're important in sort of telling the story. Um, so, th so the interpretation we have for the moment, sort of you know, intermediate conclusion, is that um, in, a, in a sentence, what you have, what what is you know, what is theta phase, or what is this? Well, theta is roughly 200 milliseconds ballpark, 200 250 milliseconds. So that would be sort of the the as a conceptual model, what this would mean is that you have a temporal window of roughly that size that slides over the input and the phase of which is sensitive to the information. I mean, it's not, not brain science, as it were. I mean, <laughs> or that is brain science. Uh, so, but that, that's sort of the interpretation we have for the moment, right? So a really critical modulation rate is the theta modulation rate, which is, as I told you earlier, closely, closely related to the syllabic rate of the speech. Right, so far so good? Right. Now, this was all about speech. So in a follow-up experiment that Juan and I are doing, or have is already completed, it's still not rejected. If any of you as a reviewer, please, you know, <laughs> moving right along. I mean, Jesus. Uh, so th this experiment was all about speech, and because that's ultimately, obviously, what we're interested in. But of course, it's driven by an acoustic property of speech. This has nothing to do with meaning, right? This has to do with an ac the acoustic attributes of a complex speech signal. So we want to know, well, if it's really true, as I was telling you in the beginning, that there are these privileged time constants, how privileged are they? What kind of, and is it, you know, can I generalize the previous result? So here's the experiment we did um, to follow up on this. We took some, uh, well, basically FM sweeps, narrowband FM sweeps, like, you know, little whistles. <laughs> and we chose uh, three different lengths of these. So 25 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, and 200 milliseconds. These are obviously the time scales of interest, right? These suspicious time scales. Uh, so this is the one you know, in the theta band, roughly. The shortest one is in the gamma band. And then we chose an intermediate one. It would be rough, roughly alpha. And uh, we don't in, notice it's, not, it's chosen from some distribution, not an, ax, not an absolute value. So you don't have some kind of entrainment of a particular rhythmicity. Now, people uh, listen to this extremely annoying sound, and we do exactly the same experiment we just did. And now the question is, well, what gives with the, uh, with the phase and power of the response? And uh, what's kind of neat uh, is the following. So we can ignore the lower two. The, ignore, the lower two are basically analysis of the power. Again, power coherence, there was no interesting differences. So nothing, you can't actually get your jollies from the power. But now notice the phase coherence again. The, phase, now the analysis shows, is, this is actually for all, all channels over the entire head. This is for the channels over the auditory cortex. So what's going on? Well, these are the different, uh, the different colors are the different segment durations that we chose. So let's take a really short one, 25 milliseconds seconds ago, you know, beep, 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 beep. Which part of the brain response is maximally uh, sensitive to that, right? So, well, the gamma band, if I analyze the gamma band response of the brain, it gives you the best, uh, it, it gives you the most kick in terms of coherence. But for the other two, you don't really, uh, so you don't get that for the alpha and the theta. Right, so there's a relationship between the temporal structure of the stimulus and the phase coherence of the brain response. The same is true for the theta. So if I have a theta, uh, if I have a, a low modulation frequency sound, it gives me a lot of kick in the low modulation frequency brain response and not in the other two. But why, why should that be the 
Now, now the real kicker here is this. Take the middle one. Well, if it's just driving the frequency into the brain, if I just take that and I just put it in, then I should get it out, but I don't. Right? So that really, I mean, that's pretty neat, because it really suggests that you take the whatever temporal modulation the signal has, and you squeeze it into these different non-overlapping temporal modulation bands. So it's not just that you take any temporal modulation and it gives you, you know, temporal modulation in, temporal modulation out. It gives you temporal modulation and it says, I really like this and I really like that. So there's like dual temporal windows that you have a kind of privileged relationship with for the analysis. So uh, please accept soon. It's a nice, sim simple, it has the elegance of simplicity. Can you please touch the screen? Can I what? Can you please touch the screen? I can touch the screen. Okay. Oh, it's very bizarre. Okay, uh, now, so last experiment. So the first experiment was on speech, and it was in particular on continuous speech, just spoken sentences, so very ecologically valid. This last one was on really kind of bizarre sounds, but where the structure of the stimulus was motivated by considerations of the acoustics of speech, and suggests that really it gives evidence, further evidence for the slow modulation frequency, sort of theta band syllabic related information, and it also gives evidence for this dual temporal window idea. But if my claim is right, that uh, this is always, that this is just an architectural property of the system, that is, Information comes in and you split it into, you sort of, te you, uh, well, into, te that there are temporal windows of principled sizes that deal with all the information that's coming in. Then it should be a property of the system that's always there, right? Independent of any stimulus. So that's a little harder to show, but my colleague Annelise Giraud, uh, in a kind of heroic and clever experiment, believes this hypothesis even more than I do and did the following study. So remember the prediction of this from earlier on. So the prediction is that you have different distributions of cells with different preferred time constants. One interpretation of that would be that temporal integration on different scales is reflected as oscillatory activity. Right? So this is what theta really is. Theta is, an, is a modulation at a particular frequency. Right? So let's say 4, 6, 8 hertz. And this would be gamma. So this is... so. Temporal integration on particular scales should be reflected as oscillatory brain activity. Now, uh, and there's a, uh, uh, notice that there was a hypothesis about some kind of anatomic asymmetry. That is, the right hemisphere seems to have a larger proportion of slow integrators, so more theta, less gamma, and the left hemisphere, more gamma, less theta. That's sort of a quirky prediction, right? That's something that I really derived, believe it or not, in my dissertation because I was reviewing a huge amount of the lesion literature on auditory cognition. So it's a very old and weird prediction. Um, but Annelise went out to test it in a really uh, kind of fascinating way. Um, this is a postdoc who didn't want to have his face shown. Like, what gives, by the way? Like, free publicity, you're a postdoc, you're going to need a job. I don't understand. Okay. Anyway, I will not name this person, and therefore he will not be eligible for a position. Um, we did a, the following experiment. We, in the sense of Annelise, she really ran this experiment, and all, all, the, the, all the credit and, uh, is, is due to her. This is an experiment where she would do simultaneous recording of EEG and fMRI. Right? So a person wears an EEG cap with special kind of electrodes that, are, that uh, don't get messed up by being in the high magnetic field, right? So carbon electrodes. And you stick this faceless postdoc that shall remain nameless into the scary fMRI machine. And we've done this experiment twice, once at 1.5 Tesla in Frankfurt and once at 3 Tesla in London. Uh, now, here's what you do in this experiment. Nothing. You just lie there and you go, you know. You don't move properly. Well, you don't move, otherwise you can like, no, you don't move. Uh, but what you do is you do so. You know, when you do nothing, you're actually doing something like you know, my wife is really pissed off with me. You know, I can't pay the mortgage. That kind of thing. You know, milk, eggs. Um, so what we did is the following experiment: we record the EEG continuously for 20 minutes while you're doing nothing that is making your internal laundry list and so on. And every so often, every few seconds, we record fMRI whole brain volume. So you're lying there, you go. Brrrt and then nothing happens. And you record the entire anatomy, okay? 
Now, now here's, the, here's the clever thing that Annalisa did. She took the EEG data and filtered it into the frequency bands of interest, right? the suspicious frequency bands. So one is more in the, uh, in the theta band and one's more in the gamma band. The particular choices, by the way, are obviously constrained by other characteristics of the noise in the entire system. MRI makes noise, so you have to actually first measure the entire system. You have to measure the MRI scanner, and then you have to choose your thing carefully like to fall in where there's no extra noise, which is a huge pain in the neck. So she takes the EEG signal, filters it into, these, into the bands that we're carrying, that the theory suggests we should test. She then takes each of the EEG signals and convolves it with the, with the hemodynamic response function, which is basically now like a canned thing in every fMRI analysis package, right? And you now use that EEG, the EEG data convolved with the hemodynamic response, and you use it as a regressor for your fMRI data. And you say, well, which part, where do I see brain activation, localized brain activation, as a function of just the temporal modulation of interest. I mean, kind of cool, and my, your first intuition has to be, there is no way this can work, right? It's crazy. But it worked, right? And it worked in a really fascinating way. Uh, there's, and there's, there's two really neat wrinkles to this. So first part. Uh, here's the first experiment. But why, one, why would one do this experiment twice? Because of reviewers. <laughs> right. This is very expensive experimentation. Right? To do a concurrent EEG fMRI experiment this is very complicated, requires a lot of bodies and a lot of money. Each, uh, and so to do it twice at two different field strengths means either you're insanely rich and have a Max Planck Institute, or the reviewers made you do it. <laughs> okay. So the reviewers made us do it. Thank you if you were here. You owe me like 40,000 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a really big dinner. Uh, now here's what I find. The different blobs are the correlations now between the electrophysiological activity and the hemodynamic response. So here's the, the positive correlation with the theta band. And notice, where is it? More on the right. Good times. Uh, correlation with the gamma band here. Okay, that's pretty nifty. I mean, that, that really was extremely unexpected. Even more unexpected was that it would happen again. <laughs> that was very unexpected and an extremely lucky break. Like in my, no, nothing. Th th well, we had to do it with eight males because, well, here's the kind of thing that, you know, in brain imaging reviewers talk about. Males are more lateralized. You know, you have to control very, rest you know, very much for handedness and familial handedness. Do they have, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to worry about the sort of uh, psychological stuff. It's, it's reasonable to worry about it. It's a, it's a, this was actually men and women mixed. Yeah, and this is all men, but you, you get the same distribution, right? So this is, and the paper is published, one can read about it. Okay, so that, that's kind of a neat result. What, what's the part of the neat result is, of course, this suggests that that intrinsic oscillatory activity that samples at the two time scales is actually an architectural property. It's not something that's driven in by the stimulus, but it's that uh, the populations there have, a, let's say, a natural resonant frequency that interacts in a principled way with the stimulus of interest. Now here's, but here's the thing that I really liked. I mean, this, I obviously like this, right? But, you know, there's no way, you should, be, you should be like, there's no way the entire, you know, of the entire brain that you sampled, there were these two blobs, right? There had to be more blobs, come on, right? There are always more blobs, it's a correlational analysis. Where were the other blobs? Okay, there are a couple of other blobs, but there was one key, key blob, okay? And that is the, the blob of interest. And the blob of interest in both experiments was actually over the jaw and tongue area in the motor cortex. And that's kind of cool, right? So in both experiments, we find exactly the same. So first, you have to define where people's motor cortex is, right? By having them move their tongue around in their mouth and go la, la, la. That's kind of easy. That's low-hanging fruit, right? The, but, the, but then you find this oscillatory activity in the same blobs. Now, I have to say, I'd like to see this replicated. I think it's too good to be true. but. Um, it, it, was, it was true at least once, and what that means is that you now have, let's say, the temporal currency of the relationship between the motor system and the auditory system are sort of aligned. As if we think the auditory system works on breaking things into natural units, roughly syllabic size units and, let's say, segmental size units, this suggests that the same size temporal modulation 
is visible in the motor system that's responsible for generating this stuff. And that means it puts you in a sort of common temporal currency, which is very useful. So these are sort of the temporal euros for speech perception production. Yeah. So what if I'm talking to you on a second out of page with you? Uh, well, remember that these windows are pretty broad, so that's going to, you know, it's not going to bother me much. Right? Well, I suppose, okay. maybe, I'm, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding yeah. what, the, what the results are. Yeah. That so, so I understand the notion of something integrating over to uh, a millisecond, uh, uh, but you said you're talking about some kind of global pulse. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the global pulse is doing. Well, no, right. Okay, so that's a, yeah. Okay, what the interpretation of the, so is is something like this. This is a marker for for cells that seem to have some intrinsic. I mean, that like that particular oscillatory frequency, right? The same one that turned out to be relevant in the auditory system. I see. Okay. Right. So that all that. So all these cells have different phases. Yeah, all they are, all have different phases. Yeah, okay. all, all this means at the moment is that they have a preferred time constant. Yeah, okay. And when the signal comes in, they can basically, so one thing would maybe, maybe you set the phase to zero with, with a, maybe that's what an onset does, right? Maybe the onset, like, you know, hi, maybe the rising edge of that says, I'm going to align everyone right now. Yeah. I mean, that's a very interesting problem. How do, you, how do you actually deal with the varying phase of this stuff? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. So you're saying, you're saying that the, jaw and large tongue muscle system, which is the thing that goes at 4 hertz in speech, is receiving this uh, sort of phantom excitation as part of listening for speech. Yes. So well, I, I, well, I don't know if I want to say that yet, because that's not what this shows. This simply shows that they work on the same clock speed. Look, right. which has to be true. I mean, in some sense, conceptually speaking, how could it be? Well, I'm not, yeah, look, I'm not that surprised either. Otherwise, it but how could it? It could have been otherwise, right? Right. If you believe in an uncoupling of the perception and production systems. Now you go to another species which has a system that runs at some other clock yes. where it's not specific. You should, you should find, I mean, if there is, if that species has an internal forward model of its vocal tract, which it's going to have, then it should be at that clock speed. So among birds, are there not such? Well, look, I mean, I don't know, we have to ask, I don't know, Alison Dope or someone, or, I mean, you know, look, th that's not the, uh, or Michael Fee, I guess, who you know cools the brain now, cools the songs down. I mean, I I, I don't want to actually put too much plasticity in this, right? Because the one reason is that the gamma band stuff seems to be a real. I mean, so we talked about this with Nancy Coppell a couple of weeks ago in Boston, and the it seems to be really a biophysical property of networks. Independent of, of uh, yeah, so it's just it's just the biophysics of, of neurons, and so it shouldn't matter that you're a bird or a ferret or a human, if it's like if you can so Coppell and her colleagues reproduce it in a dish, right? So rhythmicity at the gamma and theta levels seem on their view are just a proper uh, basically an electrical engineering property of the thing. It shows up in vision. It shows up in yeah, somatic sense. So, so I. Yeah. So I mean, so that raises an interesting problem. So is it you know is it really that different than other species? If it's really a pro an, an architectural property at that level of detail that is simply the biophysics of networks, then it shouldn't change that much. I mean, it should change within some pretty principled boundaries. I don't know. This is like way out of my league. But I mean, I, I take Coppell to me be my informant on this, and if it's uh, since she has the most data on this. And if it's true, then why be more plasticity oriented than, say, you know, although we, as we know, attention is the new plasticity. And, you know. So David, again, let me back up and try to yeah. understand the change we made here. So here's a person, and he or she is just lying in this fMRI slash EEG yeah. machine. And all you're saying is they have neurons, and, and the filtering from the theta band and the gamma band basically says, where are the neurons whose activity is most correlated with the four hertz? Yes. Or most correlated yes. with the three hertz? Yes. That's basically all they're looking That's for. all I'm looking for. They're not doing anything. They're, they're not doing anything. Thinking, no. They're, their, they're not doing anything. They're living their life. And, and so I like this. And all that's happening is that you're saying that when you look at the region where there is most response to yeah. three hertz, yeah, four hertz, hertz yeah. it happens to be in those places. Yeah. And not, not only that, it's a little lopsided. It's in one hemisphere as you thought. Yes. And, but more than the yeah. sensory part, the 
uh, and the there's second a, part. It's also, the it's also in the production part. That's, that's, that's exactly, that's a good, articulate, concise summary of this. This is exactly right. So what, what does that mean? I mean, we're kind of coming towards the end of the sort of overall story. Well, it means that there are sort of the timescales of interest that I talked about. Why are they of interest? Because they relate to systematic properties of the speech signal. They relate to, to syllabic and segmental information in the signal, which I just happen to believe you need. Show me a theory in which you don't need that, and I'll be pretty pumped. Okay? But so far, you're no, there's no other game in town. So those timescales really matter to me. And, but it turns out that the neuronal properties of the human brain that, uh, are there independently of this. So it's not just that I'm taking a speech signal and I'm pumping it into your brain and seeing those. It's that those, those timescales are there for non-speech signals, as I showed you in the other experiment. But more interestingly, they're just there. It's, they're independent of putting a stimulus in. Now that makes sense if it's just a property of the biophysics of these networks. They just are what they are. That, those are the cards you were dealt with. You were dealt with cards that have certain time constants. Therefore, you have to work with them. You can't work, I mean, you can, you know, unless you're like Klingon or something like that, right? You ha those are the ones you have to work with. And so it's interesting. So there's a systematic mapping from that kind of biophysical time constant to the cortical response to the speech signal. And so what this is, the game is about that I'm trying to play here is to identify sort of linking hypotheses or linking concepts between the neurophysiology and the properties of the speech signal that we know to be important for intelligibility, because that's obviously what we're kind of interested in. Yeah. So if you were to go and do the same experiment in a, in a tribe somewhere that they really have radically different production speech, you know, but which how radically different could it be? It's a human brain, right, in a human vocal tract. Well, would you have to have some pathology? Oh, some, pathology. some pathology. Would you see these uh, different effects? So, I mean, uh, goes back to the adaptation business. Oh. Well, you're really wanting to go to those boundary conditions there, the, the, the pathological tribe. <laughs> this is a question I've not been asked before. I have to say, I've been asked lots of questions, but oh, the you know, newborns might be different. No, actually, newborns I think are even more, even more the same. I think newborns actually are especially sensitive to syllabic modulation, as it turns out. Actually, the work of Jacques Mailer and Janet Worker and others have suggested very compellingly that syllabic rate modulation is absolutely key for, for newborns. So that's going to be the same. For it's an interesting... For newborns to be able to distinguish uh, speech from... They, dis they distinguish, for instance, rhythm classes that way. Andreas, you mean yeah. like this no, but that's not enough of a pathology. That's, you know, that's... What about if people were listening to meaningful speech? Would the same connection show up with greater strength? Uh, well, sure. I mean, that was the experiment run, right? So, I mean, there, it's modulated by intelligibility, right? So that thing, so I can make that response go up and down as a function of how intelligible it is. But I mean, I'll, so that's not... Oh, I see. So you want okay. So you want you want a real uh, re-examination of the motor theory, motor theoretic claim. So no, right? So I mean, I, I can't measure that with the machines I have, as it turns out, for for technical for technically not interesting reasons. But look, that's a slightly different claim. There, that's the question of whether um, the areas implicated in the production of intelligible speech are causally implicated in its comprehension, and they're not. Right, that's the, that's the rub. Now, modulo this. They're not because you can have a lesion all, you can have your frontal lobe blown out and actually already Bloomstein and colleagues showed many years ago that the frontal lobe lesion doesn't uh, impair, com doesn't compromise comprehension. So that's a non-starter. But the interesting thing is maybe, we're, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about the motor theory of speech perception. Maybe we should be thinking about the auditory theory of speech production. Right. That is, if there are posterior areas that actually play a causal role in conditioning how the output is programmed, then you're in business. Let me give you, a, well, I mean, I'm at the end, let me give you actually a picture. A word is worth a thousand pictures, as my dad always says. I mean, that's actually the claim of the, to some extent, that's the, that's the claim that Hickok and I are making about this, right? So we think that this box right here and Hickok's done a lot of work on this. It's called the Sylvian parietotemporal area. So right here is actually a critical, so that's a posterior area that you wouldn't think of as a motor area. You'd think of it as a sensory area. When you blow out that part of the brain, you can't hear or speak very well. <laughs>
you're really toast, right? Because that's really at the nexus of mapping from sound to lexical representation and from sound to articulatory representation. Yes? What about the angular gyrus and how that's integrated from logical short-term memory? That's, a, right, so that's a little bit different. I mean, well, not, not, now I need another figure. That, that, now I need a figure from last week's paper. Let me see if I can find it. How detailed an answer do you want? I mean, the, let me, let, let's, let, let, I mean, sin, since we're here, I mean, here. Since we're here, we can say something, right? So the angular gyrus in my world is a little, so this is a new paper that I highly recommend, Cortical Network for Semantics. Every word is true. Now, the previous one, it was actually every other word. <laughs> Here we did a better job. This is because a graduate student took the main role in this one. In the other ones, I, I was in charge. Right, so notice in this, so this is actually a functional anatomy of, of uh, the, for semantic processing. So now it's the, trying to integrate mapping both, so the, the other one is purely the formal representation of words. Right. Now the question is, you have to map, you have to obviously have the link of the formal part, let's say the phonological part, to the semantic part. That, I think, so there the angular gyrus is where, where the angular gyrus comes in. So the angular gyrus is going to provide an anatomic link from actually pure formal phonology to, to actually not just lexical semantics, but actually combinatorial semantics. So the view that we're pushing in this paper, lexical storage is pretty much here. And anterior temporal cortex and angular gyrus play a critical role in actually combinatorial semantics. And that can be combinatorics at lower level at the so, so of putting things together. And that's where its role is going to come from in short-term memory. That is, you have to look things up, and then it's this interplay from angular gyrus to frontal cortex that's going to be at the root. That's a very different story, because it's not actually involved in... in uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, uh, for, for the straight, let's say the straight up decomposition of sounds into their parts and then doing something like subvocal rehearsal and phonological encoding, I'd say the supramarginal gyrus is more implicated than the angular gyrus. I mean, this is presumably, um, there, so this is at least Paul Lezu's story that I would adopt. But look, that's a good question, who the hell knows, because the entire, so the inferior parietal lobe and angular gyrus, supramarginal gyrus, this whole area is so damn complicated and one of the problems is we have these vanilla monolithic interpretations, right? So we say, we talk as if this were one area, or we, t you know, the same thing for here, I say middle temporal gyrus, but is it that we didn't learn the lesson from vision? I mean, in vision, people took this part and the back apart, took the sheet, looked in and said, oh my God, not, you know, obviously the six different layers do completely different things. There's blobs, there's interblobs, there's cells that have completely, you know, even on a view like Martin and Douglas, that you have the cortical canonical microcircuit. Each of those is different. This part is GABAergic, this part is not. So, I mean, this continuous interpretation of brain areas as these monolithic, functionally described things is sort of embarrassing at this point. That does not stop us from publishing it. Right? <laughs> but, I mean, it's sort of a, it's supposed to be a hypothesis space. So, in terms of the working memory, for phonological working memory, I'd say, um, if it has a role at all, the angular gyrus, it's because it's linked to meaning and not it's linked to phonological form, which case is more, a, I'd say, super marginal gyrus. That's the, uh, uh, that's what I believe off the cuff right now. If you buy me a couple of beers, I'll, I'll, I'll think harder about it, but, you know. And that's, I think, all I have to... Well, if we don't stop now, we won't have time for the beers. <laughs> well, I can, let me give you my last slide, though, because it's important. Well, it's not important. Nothing's important, but... The, my la I, I want to say something, I mean, just to, sort of to leave you with a, you know, a particular kind of myth. Well, that's, a, that's historical. We all, we, you know, even in the Middle Ages, we did this kind of work. But what I want to <laughs> you know, we stick people in ovens and then see what comes out. Um, what I, I, I want to end on a slightly different, on a particular point, which is I've emphasized from the auditory analysis point of view that there, is, there, there are privileged timescales. Uh, is that there are timescales that have uh, principled uh, 
biophysically conditioned relationship to what we care about. But I am not a two time scale imperialist. As I am aware that there are other time scales that mediate other phenomena that we worry about deeply and vigorously. For instance, you know, localization and things like you know, Jeffress model type phenomena happen at a different scale. Things like the simultaneity threshold or gap detection happen on a very different scale. But I think there are at least two time scales that subsume a range of psychoacoustic phenomena that really play an essential role for the analysis of the speech signal. And it's not accidental. And I think it's these two that I want to emphasize that we can, you know, that the short time and longer term temporal integration play something really, play a surprisingly rich role in the perceptual analysis of that. And I think it merits sort of a, a deeper view. I mean, all I really want to stimulate is sort of a, a discussion of that particular issue. So with that, uh, that's enough. Thank you very much. And don't get your head caught in the vice. So, thanks. <laughs>
So something as stupid as the auditory M1, which is generated by just saying a sound like, you know, you know any, any sound generates that, the amplitude of that response is severely downregulated if you're speaking, suggesting that you really have, you know, that there's a sort of a complex gain control thing going on between the output and the input system. So this, it's a really, and it's a hard problem to find this really, because on the one hand, we, the data shows it's not necessarily causally necessary. On the other hand, there's so much evidence that they play together. What's going on? This, this, this is why I like this no, notion of an internal forward model that's not necessary for successful comprehension, but uh, it, sure, it sure as hell helps it. So. Yeah? Uh, how indicative are the, the oscillations, the, the neurosynchrony, and the other, I mean, certainly there are other neural codes, are there other things we can look at besides just these synchronies for, uh, for uh, isolating uh, regions and things like that? Um, what, you, you want to isolate functional regions of the brain? Is that? Right. Well, I mean, suppose you do single unit, for the, for, forget what we do. I mean, how would you do it with another method? Right, you stick an electrode in, right, and you have hopefully a theory or a model, and you say, if I stick an electrode in here, what do I have to do to drive the cell? Right? I mean, that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. Now, remember, it took Hubel and Weasel a long time to find what were the things that actually drove so called simple cells in V1, or Area 17, it was then called, right? I mean, so this idea that, you know, you can find something that's the receptive field or you know, that drives the STRF successful is very complicated. And so given that the machines we have are quite coarse and record from, uh, so the things that we record from are roughly 10 to 50,000 neurons at a time. And so the notion that you could say, can I identify this region versus that region? It's very complicated. It's a good question. I mean, that's actually a question I asked somebody this afternoon at his thesis defense. <laughs> and it was a painful afternoon for that guy, certainly. Um, because it's very, very difficult. And unless you have a hypothesis going in that this is what cells care about, and this would be the forward model of how that receptive field property would translate to a big mesoscale signal. That's like super hard. So you always need a forward model of some kind. So your theory of um, modulation perception and certain circuit, if I from like what Thorsten Dow mm -hmm. is most filter band. Say, mm -hmm. because they are looking for filters which are kind of overlapping. Yes. You are saying something little bit different. Yes. They are two. Yes. And what happens in between basically is to be accommodated. That's right. Yeah. Like one over the other. Yeah. So I say that that's right. There's no. There's not an arbitrary number of filter banks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. And so I would say. I mean, that's not to say that there are none. I mean, there's. You know, there's, it's. It's a biological system. There's. But I think they're, they're, they, they have a privileged status, that there's modulation filter banks that really are, have, let's say, a, a higher neuronal representation. There's, there's more of them, basically. Yeah, That's it is more of a feeling, actually, what you are saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would, the, the proof is in the pudding. I'd have to show that those intermediate, I mean, I'd have to show a lot of experiments that that's, uh, sort of over a whole range of modulations, I end up with only very small groups, and those groups are the ones that end up being interpreted for the case of intelligibility. I mean, I think. Two are talking, the two models are talking at different levels. First thing that is more in the peripheral and central. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's a, it's a similar uh, foot topic. Yeah. Like Just my last question. How, can you say something about how do you view the segmental analysis and the static <coughs> analysis and interactive once they happen? <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to ask me that. That's a, ask me like an easy question. Don't ask me a hard question. I'm completely unreasonable. I mean, look, as you know, I have no answer for that kind of thing. Because if I did, I would also have an answer to how do you bind color and motion in a visual stimulus. I mean, that's no different. It's the same kind of problem. That is how you, you, you break problems down into sub-problems, basically because the brain is Cartesian, right? It makes, you know, Discours de la méthode, right? You make small problems. The visual system makes it into, let's say, 50 little subproblems. The auditory system makes it maybe into two dozen little subproblems. If it makes it into a segmental, into a syllabic size problem, how do I bind the information together? I have the vaguest idea, except I know that you do, because I have a lot of fascinating data 
that show the interaction between syllabic and segmental information. Right? So I've done these weird experiments with Maria based on the Drollman things that, that actually work pretty well. So how, you know, I don't know how that, I mean, some people would say that's a higher order oscillation, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all gamma, yeah, it's a, you know, high gamma, but that, that's, a, that's too hard a question. Why don't you figure that out? I mean, there we need a, yeah. I mean, we need a computational model that we can then go back and test with, yeah. because, I mean, that, that's just a binding problem question, and I just, it's a, I, I just, if I knew, I'd be really rich, though, and well, famous. Are these famous. At least famous. I mean, better would be rich, but famous, okay. So there is, a, there is a, an old theory coming from Soviet Union, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. where they say, well, actually, what we are listening for are the sounds, say, for this. Mm -hmm. But what we are using for that is a relatively long segment of the signal. Mm -hmm. which would be this uh, 200, 300 mm -hmm. milliseconds, which we are pursuing sort of for engineering reasons, and this, this seems to be working reasonably well. Would that somehow work with your theory? Mm -hmm. so essentially, you do have two scales, uh, but the larger scale is it's first. extracting the, the information yeah. about it on the smaller scale. Yeah, that's... That, that's absolutely... I mean, I think that would be very exciting if that were true. I mean... <laughs> Well, I don't know if we do it. I mean, that would be, I, I would love to know because, I mean, what it would mean, it would be that th this is the way the world works. You bite off the future in big bites, and then behind it, exactly. you take little bites that actually anal that fill, fill in the sort of hypothesized bigger. So this is, this is why I like analysis by synthesis. Analysis by synthesis says, I actually have predictions on this scale about the future based on my prior in a sort of Bayesian world, but I'm going to fill it in on, the, on this much higher scale based on whatever. And so I think that would be very cool if true, but it would always predict that for the same signal there should be a huge difference between the, what the theta information carries and the gamma information carries. I mean, that would be kind of crazy but exciting if true. I, I, would, be completely, I would be completely psyched about that result, actually. It would be great. I mean, it would be so weird, right? It would mean the world that you, ha you experience the future in s chunks of a certain size and that, the, re and that the, the, the real things that you're analyzing lag behind. Right, I mean, and sort of like science fiction, right? We know that the mosh, the you know, if you really well, think of moving your hand, but the mouth, your hand is moving behind. Your hand is moving behind, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 That's, the, that's the internal forward model of this thing, right? So that's, I mean, that's why I keep harping on you really want to have an internal forward model for this. There's no reason why the, the, the mouth should be any different from the, your arm from the hand. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, well, I often, have, I often have wished that my mouth were different. From my hand. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you got what you got. That's a, that's a psychiatric issue, not an, engin an engineering issue. <laughs> a, we can have yes. one more question. Is there the last question? Okay, let's go for beer. Yes, hooray. Thank you. Thank you.